And then also the way that these um, family offices or the Rockefellers create their bank is by having it in there and then other people have access to it. So it's kind of the same philosophy um, that uh, I, I spent a couple days um, with David Green, founder of Hobby Lobby, who's just unbelievable. I mean, this guy runs one of the most successful companies ever. You know, Hobby Lobby, for most people, they, they don't know that this company has zero debt and it's going to do over $10 billion this year. Right? So, like, think about that. And they give away half their profits. For 30 years, they've given away half of their profits every single year. Do you guys consider life insurance an asset allocation? And if so, what percentage should it be? That's different per person, but if someone's doing a, you know, 60, 40, and 40% 40 towards fixed in income instruments, I'm putting, in my situation, everything fixed income into that. I don't think of it as an investment that's a growth tool. It's a storage unit for my money that I could tap into when growth is in more favor, or I'm going to be you know, changing that allocation. So it, it's a situational thing. But what I like to do is just take 15% of when I'm paying myself and put that towards the cash value, because I could always use that cash value for other things when it comes up. So if you look at it like that, it's a 15% allocation, right? Now, there was someone I had on my podcast, Scott Ford, I believe, uh, who is- Who bought Freedom Fast Track, one of my companies, and is a wonderful human being. Just Unbelievable. So you know. Yeah, yeah I, I love yeah. How, how close you guys- guess, actually, who I, guess who introduced him to insurance? You? Yeah. All right. He didn't, he didn't have any and didn't uh, offer it, and he did an immersion, spent the day with me, which I love to do, so, so he is cool. a wonderful human. I love that, and um, I, actually, your friend that you introduced me to, Rich Christensen, introduced me to him, so, you know, full circle. Yeah. But he talked about how his portfolio is 50% bond, but that 50% is life insurance, whole life insurance. So think of the extreme, 15% up to 50%, you know, I'm probably somewhere in the middle of that. Two questions. A little clarity on I thought I heard you can leverage life insurance policies on like a business debt instead of real estate. Is that accurate? And then the second uh, question I have is, can you share a framework on how to prove IP? Like if I write some obscure doc that I share with people, how would I turn that into something I can depreciate or amortize? Well, like if you go to like, if you go to ripwater.com and then put like how to work with, like, I, this isn't this isn't for like, you guys to work with me in my IP company, but you can download my brand manual. And my brand manual is my licensing document for financial advisors that want to use my content. So ripwater.com, you like click around in the in the top there and you'll see there's a whole brand manual. It is it spells out exactly the IP that I have, how people utilize the IP. I created that in 2012. So like when I shared that with the attorney that evaluates, and then he looked at the body of work, he, he estimated a very large number. So it's really about getting the right attorney that can analyze it, which I've already connected to Justin for this network, the people that do that. Okay. Or you can also go to crushwater.com. That's mine. It's even better <laughs> strategy. And then, thanks, Garrett. And then what about the life insurance using as leverage on like business debt for a like, transaction, if you wanted to buy a business? Like just well, I just, I just had cash value, so I just used my cash value to buy a business because I could close quick. And I, I, you know, I wasn't like okay. using SBA, which you know how long that could take. Or, yeah. you know, so for me, it was just, hey, I'm going to use this cash. They don't know where the cash came from, but it was from my insurance policy. Then I just paid it back when I wanted. There are two strategies. One, you can just buy the easiest, the cleanest, the simplest, the fastest is to just borrow against the cash values. The other is you really can pledge your whole life policy to a bank as collateral to okay. get a bank loan. So you and can do either. I've done that either. before with the death benefit. It's a collateral assignment, and you can give a percentage of that. Okay. And sometimes when people borrow, like they want a collateral assignment from the bank to make sure that you know they're going to be taken care of. So yeah. I know dentists that were buying dental practices that had to have insurance as part of the gig for the loans to come through. Okay. Thank you. So just one question. If someone wanted to get started with a policy, is that something you offer, or do you have partners that we should talk to to begin the process after learning about it? That. I've definitely got partners. And uh, we're talking with Lifestyle about supporting it at a higher level. So if you go to cashflowbanking.gg, you can fill out a, a little bit of detail there. And that'll determine which partner we send you to that's certified and, and, and has expertise in it. So cashflowbanking.gg is in Garrett Gunderson.
if you go to dot com, oh, it's, it's a totally it's a totally different. GG was. Yeah, dot com is going to send you to a company I sold, and I don't I don't have any involvement with that. So this one I am going to make sure you get in the right hands. Thank you. Yep. Very very informative. With kids. Um, and my wife, let's say, I, 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 I did the whole life for myself now, so I've got that going. If I do it for my kids, I, I don't personally do it and buy it for them. I have them buy it themselves. Or it's up can to I, you. Can I pull that money out? If so, I have, so let me break it down how it works. You have the owner of the policy, you have the insured, and you have the beneficiary. The owner controls the policy, and you can change ownership over time. So you could say, I'm owning a policy on my kids who are the insured, and your estate plan could be the beneficiary, your trust. You could change the beneficiary at any time as the owner, and you can change the owner, if you agree to it as the owner, any time you want as well. And by the way, if you are high net worth, the best ownership of any insurance plan is an asset protection trust, because it will remove it from your estate taxes, and it does what the Rockefellers have always taught, you'll own nothing and control everything. See, in 2013, they came out with these rules that said, you can have an asset protection trust, so now the trust owns your, your policy, not you, but there's a distribution trustee. People used to do what's called an islet, an irrevocable life insurance trust removed from their estate, but they also removed access to the cash value along the way. And you have to file crummy letters, which are kind of crummy, and you have to do your gifting. And an asset protection trust, it removes it from your estate but you control the distribution trustee. So let's say I'm your distribution trustee and you go, hey, I want some money. I'm like, no, you can fire me and hire Justin, who's much nicer. <laughs> and then he's like, sure, here you go. So the owner, I own my kids' policies. Oh, well, my asset protection trust does. Might I eventually have that go into their names? I, I could choose to do that. Or they could just be part of my asset protection trust and get whatever benefits inside of there. But I, my kids don't get an inheritance as, my, as our friend Scott Donald says, they get a heritage. They're, they, they're not entitled to any money at all. What they could do is utilize what I've created as a way to create opportunity and jump through a little bit less hoops and get preferred rates. But nothing's free in my family because I don't want to spoil and create entitled kids. I love that. That's, that's amazing. And, and by the way, uh, a few things, so uh, an asset protection trust or a, a DAP, and a yep. domestic asset prote protection trust um, is going to remove it from your estate. So let's say this cash value grows really big, your death benefit off often will follow, depending on the type of policy, your death benefit should grow as your uh, cash value grows, but as it's out of your estate, then it's not going against that uh, threshold on estate tax. And then also the way that these um, family offices or the Rockefellers create their bank is by having it in there and then other people have access to it. So it's kind of the same philosophy um, that uh, I, I spent a couple days um, with David Green, founder of Hobby Lobby, who's just unbelievable. I mean, this guy runs one of the most successful companies ever. You know, Hobby Lobby, for most people, they, they don't know that this company has zero debt and it's going to do over $10 billion this year. Right, so like think about that. And they give away half their profits. For 30 years, they've given away half of their profits every single year. Can I just say you know more about insurance than insurance agents? <laughs> well, thank you. It's quite impressive. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, I am just blown away by like, so their, their whole thing is no ownership, all stewardship. Mm, and that's, and that's, that's a good the, line. yeah, Love right? That. That's yeah. how they teach it. Like you're not gonna we don't want you to own it. We want you to steward it. We want you to be a good steward of it. We want you to help, you know, the world. Uh, you can have access to make some decisions, you can be part of the board, but you're not gonna own this in your name, and there's gonna be checkpoints to make sure that you're responsible with your stewardship. It's pretty cool. Who else? Any other? Um, so just a quick question about the t if you do, uh, you talk about putting your money in before you're buying the asset into the life insurance policy. Say you can double dip them if you do a 1031 and put that in to, it's protected before to get, and, and if you sell a property and you identify another property to buy, you can't put that money into the life insurance policy, then turn around and buy the asset as well and still use the 1031. You have to 1031 you, to a like kind exchange. Yeah, so yeah can, it has to go to a third party. That's escrow a, holding company 
to legitimize the transaction. I wonder if you could do it through a PPLI. Now, it's definitely, actually, you probably can do it yeah. through a PPLI. There are probably structures that you can do it through. Not through traditional whole life, but yeah. yeah. And, and additionally, there are also ways that, you know, this is not financial advice, but what I have heard is that there are ways that you can buy these assets and pull you know, money out of it after the fact, after a period of time, you know, refinance it and take some of that cash and then direct that back in. But that would be something that you need to run by, yeah. you know, people on. on I like how you're thinking though, like, you know. But, and by the way, this is how the best tax strategy happens is by people thinking outside the box. It's like, hey, I'd love to do this. I wonder if we can make it work. Not, you can't do this. And, and here's, like, here's where I think lifestyle investor is really unique is Justin's such a nice guy that people want to share their best ideas with him. Like when I, I'm always like, hey, have you heard of this? And what about this? And how about this? And that's how I get most of my strategy is people that bring it to me over the last 25 years and then we vet it and be like, oh, this is actually, like I, I should, like most of the strategies I didn't get by sitting and reading a book, I got because people who had already applied them and then we would take it to attorneys and accountants and vet that out, right? Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> one great lesson that I've learned in my life is to leave out all relationships with a positive wake, and and that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but because of of the positive interactions, it's like years and decades, and you know, of people that want to come back and, and share and be part and, and contribute. It's it's powerful. So um, from a relationship standpoint, that's that's been something that's really like served the relationships I've been in for what that's worth. Awesome stuff so far. Uh, so assuming it's a non-direct recognition policy or a, a non-direct recognition insurance company, uh, any preference for a direct policy loan versus an I block? And when do you do both? Or do you, you know, when, when do you, when's the right situation to, to do one or the other? So I know that you got like Justin's taught people about direct recognition versus non-direct recognition, which is if you borrow from the policy, do they change your dividend or not? And I have both. And I know that you know one might be more popularized than the other, but what I look at is I have, I have policies with Mass Mutual, Penn Mutual, One America, Guardian, um, I don't New know. York. Uh, yeah, like Emeritus actually, which I don't like. It's just one that I have. But I have a few different companies and they're not all treated the same. And the reason I have different companies is because at different times, interest rates are different from each company. And it's more advantageous to borrow from one versus another. And sometimes, even if they reduce my dividend, it's still more advantageous to borrow from that one than a direct, you know, than a non-direct recognition. They still credit you with direct, rec with direct recognition. They just don't credit you fully. You might have a half a point or a point that's shaved off. So, to me, it's understanding what, the, what policy you have and what the, um, basically, there's a dozen companies that are gonna perform well if it's designed properly. Proper design, first and foremost, you know, higher, higher cash, less commission type of stuff. And then just, right now I don't borrow from Guardian because it's a higher interest rate. I just borrowed from One America because it's 4.5. It's a, it's a lower interest rate, so it just, you know, that, I, there's probably people that are more hardcore about it than I am, probably the people I've even certified. I'm more philosophical big picture, so, yeah. And, and by the way, part of it's a cash flow game, right? So right. with an iBlock, and for those of you that are wondering, what's iBlock? So there are companies that, will, uh, that, that would love your business and will collateralize your life insurance policy and give you a loan. And a preferred rate. At a preferred rate. Yeah. And so iBlock being one of the bigger companies that does this now, because interest rates have risen, so you know that's what's happened with iBlock. Now, the beauty of iBlock is you can set it up to be an interest only. So you weigh the interest only payment with like, hey, if I just borrow it through the life insurance company, then I'm paying you know, 5%. So just because it's higher doesn't mean that it's worse, uh, but you know, it is higher, but if, you're, if your goal is to pay the least amount of interest and you're holistic, or if your goal is to, you know, t to cash flow it, I think you're gonna make different decisions. Yeah, so, back and in, I've done it both, both yeah, Seven years ago, we got someone one and a quarter by using their cash value as collateral, so we definitely took as much as they would give of one and a quarter, but it was variable. So once that's now higher, we paid it off with the cash value, but we used that for like six years. 
you know, because it, it got up to like 2.5, and then it really went up a lot a year and a half ago, so we just paid it off with the cash value. So you, got, you just look at your cost of money. And that's the beauty of it, because I did the same thing, paid it off, went back to the insurance company. Yep. So now it's cheaper money. And by the, the more, way, the way, once interest rates go down again, I'm going to take my Unblock policy The out more here. doors that you have as options, the better. It's your personal bank. That's right. Yeah, this is what we talked about yesterday. This is the bank replacement strategy, right? There is tax code specifically for this. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.